Good morning. You can wave me in the air if you can see me or hear me. Praise the Lord. Bwana atukuzwe. Good to see all of you this morning. We are happy to be in the house of the Lord for this is the day that the Lord has made. Bwana asifiwe. Are you glad you're in the house of the Lord? Are you happy you're in the house of the Lord? Tell someone, I was happy when they told me. Let's go to the house of my father. Is this the house of your father? If this is the house of your father, we can give him a shout and a clap. Appreciate him all. Exhort him. Shout to him. Lift him his, his name high. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We are happy to be here. Uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. And we are glad that he has every good plan for us, even as he has gathered us in his presence. This day, uh, I'm Moses Chege Owawero, and I thank the Lord for his grace and mercy over my life. I'm born again, and I love the Lord for who he is. I also wish to take this opportunity to thank the church leadership, Bishop and Pastor Alice for giving me this opportunity together with the pastoral team that I can stand and share the word of God this morning. I know that you came ready and the Lord is also ready for us because he knew that you are coming. And because he knew you are coming, he has already prepared a table for us. One, some years back, there is this song that we used to say that it will be unfortunate that you come to the house of God and live without knowing that there is a table ready for you. And so I would wish that we ask the Lord that this morning he may prepare you and me so that as we wait on him, he will be speaking to you. You know, it will be disastrous that you have eaten the whole week and this one opportunity that you come into the house of God, go home empty because you have a long way to go. And the Bible tells us of Elijah and it, there was this time that the Bible says of him that he had been hiding somewhere and he had a long journey ahead of him. But then when the angel of God came to him, he tells him, wake up and eat for you have a long journey ahead. It's the same thing for us this morning as we come into the house of God that the Lord desires that you may not only come, but you will come and receive something that will keep you going. And so prepare your heart because the Lord will be speaking to us. I know he has a message for us so that he can help us carry on with the journey that is ahead. Praise the Lord. My message today is titled, The Fear of God. And I know we know many times the word fear has been mentioned. And when we talk about the fear of God, a few things come into our hearts. This great God, it's possible that we can fear him for many reasons. But today I would want to bring to us what is that fear that we call fearing God. And I would want to start by saying that there are many things that are happening in life. And especially the time and the moment that we are living in. There is fear all over. There is fear of contracting COVID. And for those of us who have contracted and gotten well, we know it's not as easy as sometimes it is talked about. But we want to thank God that there is a God who also heals. There is also a God who delivers. And even though he may not deliver us now, we may say together with King Daniel that I know that I will not worship any other God because he still remains God. Praise the Lord. So this morning I would start by defining what is fear. And there are many meanings that we can pick from the various uh, dictionaries that try to help us understand what fear is. And from the Cambridge Dictionary, fear is defined as an unpleasant emotion or thought that you have when you are frightened or worried by something dangerous, painful or hard that is happening, bad that is happening, all might happen. And that is Cambridge trying to tell us what fear is. It's those thoughts 
those emotions that come to you when you think something bad or terrifying may happen to you. And a similar meaning is given by Merriam Webster Dictionary, which says also it's an unpleasant, often, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awesomeness of danger. An intense of this emotion would be seen as state that's marked by such kind of emotion. So every time you have fear, could be there is something that is running in you, which is emotion that are saying something unpleasant may happen to you or may come your way. But also the Bible has a definition of what fear is. And from a biblical definition, in the Old Testament, we find the fear described as a designation of true piety or pious, being pious, or God-fearing, or having a form of godliness. It is a fear that is accompanied with love and hope, and therefore, not that slavery, dread, but rather loving reverence. So, in contrast, we see, when we talk about the worldly fear, and when the word fear is mentioned, then it brings some emotion of worry anticipation that something bad may happen. But when we look at the Bible or the definition that comes from the Bible, then it's giving us a different interpretation of something that we are looking at God in a form of worshipping him. In a form of not fearing him as such, but a form of having love for God or being drawn to worship God in terms of loving him more. And so every time the word fear would be mentioned in the Bible, then it would bring this, uh, this state of falling before God and worshipping him, or exhorting him, of referencing him. And today we would want to ask ourselves, what is that fear? What kind of fear do you have? When we talk of fearing God, what do you have in you? Is it those emotions? Is it, is it that Fear of something bad may happen if you have an encounter with God? Or is it that reference that will come as a result of loving God? I would want us to read the Bible. And we'll be reading the Bible from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5 and verse 22. Deuteronomy. And here the Bible says, These words the Lord spoke and to, and to all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud and of the thick darkness with a great voice. And he added no more. And he wrote them into tablets of stone and delivered unto me. This is Moses speaking. Verse 23. And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, for from the mountain, or for the mountain did burn with fire, that you came near unto me, even all these heads of your tribe and your elders. And said, and you said, Behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and his greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God hath talked with man, and he liveth. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us if we hear the voice of the Lord, our, uh, our God, anymore. Then we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of fire as we have and lived? And though near and hear all that the Lord, our God, shall say, and speak thou unto us all that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee, and we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you speak unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of these people, which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would hear me and keep my commandment always that I might be well with them, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Praise the Lord. As we read that part, I would also want to read the same in the book of 
Hebrews 12 and verse 14. And the Bible says, For you are not come unto the mount that might be touched, and that burnt with fire, nor unto dark, uh, blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that had in, entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if, uh, and if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quack. But you come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the, whole, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn, which are the, are the written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men, men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of all new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on earth, which much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he, had, he has promised, saying, Yet one more I speak not to the earth only, but also to heaven. And this word you also may yet once more signify the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And as we share your word, we invite you, that Holy One of Israel, you may break the bread of life for all of us. We welcome you, we invite you, in Jesus' name. Amen. I think we have just read the Bible, and in quickly, I would want just to give a preview of what was happening. And here, we have just seen Moses first in the book of Deuteronomy, having been asked by God to ask the children of God to come to God or to meet with God. And when they came, there were conditions as to how they were to approach God. And here, we are seeing them having assembled at the place of the meeting. And when they gathered there, then there were a few conditions. One of the conditions was, you should not move close to the mountain. They were to stand at a distance. And while standing there, then God was to come so that he would meet with them. And here they are worried because as they stood there, then they are telling Moses, from today we know that God speaks to men. And as God speaks to men, then we have also realized that God, men can speak to God and still live. Though we know, the Bible says, no one can see God and live. But at this point in time, God has come to meet them. Because God is always in the business of wanting to meet you and me. At every other opportunity, God is seeking a moment that he can fellowship, that he can have a time with us so that he can, have, uh, he can reveal and make known his name. But in contrast, or if you look at it keenly, then you realize something just happened. Because though God is so good and so great, when he came, he did not just come in an ordinary way. There were thunderstorms. There was a lightning. There was darkness. The whole mountain was covered. Though this was the glory of God, the people could not comprehend because the whole place was shaking. Nobody wanted, could, uh, uh, could even withstand that glory that appeared of God. And so there was fear. And this is the kind of fear that some of us or at times we have. That every time we approach God, we approach God and instead of appreciating his glory, he comes in a different way than we expected him. 
And why would he come in a different way than we expected him? It is because there was something that was happening in them. Because one of the conditions was cleanse yourself. Wash your garments, even as you approach the throne, or as you approach the mountain of the Lord. But instead of washing themselves from inside, they cleansed their garments. So they came to God, but there was no connection between their inner persons and the, out, the person that they were coming to meet. They were already prepared. And you know, many are times that we also approach God from that point of having outward cleanliness. We have dressed well. We have clothed ourselves well. But the God that we are coming to is not the God that is just asking for your outer holiness, cleanliness, but he's asking for that inward cleanliness. And no wonder the fear of God befell them. And they tell Moses, please don't let him speak to us. Let him speak to you. And after he speaks to you, come and speak to us. The Bible tells us that at the curtain, when Jesus entered all, passed on then the cross, and he said, it's finished. That business of us telling any other person, let him speak to you and you come and speak to us, ended. The Lord is inviting us. And that's where Paul picks it in Hebrews 12. And he's now telling us, now you have come. And he says, you have not come to that mount that has fear, that was dreadful, that was full of darkness, that was full of clouds, that was full of tempests. But you have come to the holy city of God. You have come to that place where the souls of men are justified. He is telling us that now you are being invited to a God that is willing to make you have a fellowship. Praise the Lord. He is no longer desirous that when we approach him, we approach him from a point of fear. And when he says that, he's saying, you, you have come to that place where you are justified, where the firstborn, we, we, become, we, we come to where we have been, our firstborn has, we have been made part of the firstborn of Christ. Praise the Lord that we are no longer what we are. That tells us that God, as much as he's so great, as much as he's so big that the heavens of heavens cannot contain him, that the earth which is his footstool is still not enough for him, then that very God is inviting us to himself so that we may get to know to him. And there's a Kikuyu song, and it's so many times sung in funerals. And it says, now I'm approaching you, I'm coming to you, so that I may know what you do to those that you love. You reveal yourself to them. You make known your name to them. And this, the first thing that that singer says is, I am approaching you. I'm, I'm drawing nigh that I may know what you do to those that are yours. And this is what the Lord wants to do to us, that he wants us to approach him, that we may know what he does to those that he loves. One thing that I remembered as I thought of fear, I remembered when we were growing up, every time our parent went to the shamba and left you with the young ones, they used to say something. And they used to say, Choma watoto, na usikumalize chakula. Praise the Lord. You know, as they said that, they were just like God telling us that I have allowed you everything, but whatever you want with what I have done. Praise the Lord. Because the thing was, they, we feared our parent. And though they gave us the liberty to do everything, one, uchome mtoto. Knowing very well that if you did it, then there were repercussions. But as they did that, they wanted you to eat the food. Not finish the food or not to forget that you have young ones to serve. That's the same thing that God is telling us. That I love you so much. I want you to have everything. But even as you do so, then you approach me. That you may get to know me more. Praise the Lord. This is the God that we are being invited to. And it so happened that to the children of Israel... That invite that God gave them, some of them never appreciated. They never got to know what the Lord wanted them to know. Yet God desires that we may get to know him. I remember 
when I was in high school, on my box, you know, I was in this boys' school, and you know, boys are boys when they are in school. And most of the time, I was the CEO chairman, and I remember we used to keep the CEO offering in our boxes. There was no, we could not take it to the bazaar, but we kept it there because we kept using. The CEOs were very busy. But I remember on my box, I had written, God is a consuming fire. And so it so happened, maybe the whole thing created fear that many a times all the other boxes around my box would be broken into, but at no one time was my box broken into. And so there was a fear that people knew as much as I was a Christian and a CEO chairman for that matter, there was a God that they may have known that God was a consuming fire. But tonight as we come here, it's true, Paul is also telling us in Hebrews that God is a consuming fire, but God is not a consuming fire to them that know him. He's a loving father. He purifies you. He uses that fire to make you complete. He makes you who he wants you to be, even as you approach him, that you may get to know him. Praise the Lord. I want to tell us a few things that would happen that can differentiate the fear of God from the fear that the world have. What makes the fear of God different from the other fears? Number one is that perfect love takes away or expels fear. And there's one writer by the name of William D. Ainshow in an article titled Fearing God in a Christian journal called Christianity Today, he says, unfortunately, many of us presume that the world is the ultimate threat and that, God's, and, and that God functions is to offset it. How different this is from the biblical position that God is the carrier than the world. When we assume that the world is the ultimate threat, we give it unwarranted power. For the truth, the world's threats are temporary. When you expect God to balance the stress of the world, we reduce him to the world's equal. As we walk with the Lord, we discover that God possesses ominous threat to my ego, but not to me. He rescues me from my delusions so he may reveal the truth that he sets me free. He care, casts me down only to lift me up again. He sits in judgment of my sin but forgives nevertheless. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom but love from the Lord is its completion. And so in other words, the writer is telling us that when we fear the world and fear the things that are there out there, we make God smaller than the world. Our, or we make the problems bigger than our God. But every time then we get to know God, then we understand that he's working everything for our good. He's making us to, be, to get to know him in a different way so that we are able to move from where we are and get closer to him. And this I would want to speak of maybe a marriage relationship. And we know those who grew old, uh, some years back that our fathers were very tough. That any time a tough father entered into a house, then the children and the, your mother, they had to run for their dear life. Which meant that they were caring. They, were not, they did not mean good. But it also says that for every father that was good to the family, they made their family approach them. They were easier to approach. You never flew from them. Though they were this big than life, but they made the family closer. And that's the very reason or where the, the, the Bible is saying that the love of God expels fear. It does not contain you in fear because the more you love God, the more you reference God, then he becomes more lovable or oh, he becomes more approachable. And the Bible is also telling us the same when it talks of a marriage. When people love each other in a marriage relationship, the couple does not remain separate. 
they get infused. And no wonder the Bible says, and two become one. Because they no longer exist as themselves, but they get to intertwine themselves into becoming one thing that which God also desires. That the more we get to know him, we no longer remain as Moses outside God, but I become Moses inside Christ so that I reflect Christ in all that I do. Then fear is expelled because there is that love that comes into our lives. I don't know how closer we are our, ourselves with God. I don't know what position you have or what state you are in when you think of your relationship with God. Are you in that situation where God brings fear into your life instead of him becoming more approachable every time you come to him? The fear of God is being conscious of how powerful, how scaring he can be. Yet when we are right with him, we, exp we experience love his kindness, and we are able to receive that which he has for us. God is waiting to help you know the difference between the fear that is of the world and the fear that is in him. Number two, the difference between the fear of God and the fear of the world is it enables us to make the right decision. And how is that? It's because the fear of God, when it comes upon our lives, we will do everything best. We have a, a benchmark that allows us to say, I cannot do this for this. And the Bible in the book of Exodus 1 and 17, it talks of these two women, the Hebrew women, who the king of Egypt had told that for every boy child that will be born, kill them. But the Bible is telling us that every time a child was born, then one thing happened. They said, out of the fear of God, because the two women feared God, they never killed any of the sons or boy child that were born. This is the same thing that happens. There are so many things that we need to make decisions over every day. In your place of work, in your own relationship, in your own engagement, in business, and wherever we are every day, in the roads and wherever, we have to make decisions. But what will make you make a decision that will not make you have pain at the end of it? It's only that fear that says, is God looking at what I'm doing? Is God pleased with what I'm doing? Is life going to be good if I make this decision? Or you'll just make a decision for the sake of just benefiting from the decision you make. The fear of God helps us make the right decisions in life. I don't know what you base your decisions on. You have to determine what are those things that help you make a decision. And we see in the Bible, in the book of Psalms 15, and from verse uh, four, 5, David is talking and he's asking, who will ascend into the mountain of the Lord? And he said, and he gives a number of things, that for those that will ascend in the mountain of the Lord, there are few things that they will have to do. And one of the things he says in verse 5, he says, who will ascend into the holy place of God? And he answers that in verse 4, he says, he in, those, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honors them that fear the Lord. He swears to his own heart and changes not. Which means some decision you will have to make will be painful. They will be hurting to your own self. But you are doing that because of the honor of God. You will not just make a decision because they are well good pleasing. Sometimes you will have to forego that which is good for you so that you can please the one that has called you. Number three, his fear is inviting, is not repulsive. And we see this in the Bible in the book of Luke 7 and from verse 37, which I will not read, but it talks about this uh, woman that came to Jesus. And as we know, it's possible. The woman that came with a, an alabaster bottle and poured the oil on Jesus and wiped his feet. And the Bible tells us that this woman, as opposed to the person who had invited Jesus into his house, she anointed Jesus. But the anointing is not the issue. The issue is Having been said, as the Bible describes her, when it says, do you see this woman? 
who entered into the house of Simon, of, 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 of Simon, and she was a sinner. That part only disqualifies her from being in the presence of Jesus. But being that the fear of God is not repulsive, but inviting, then she approached Jesus. The same thing that is required of us, that instead of fearing God when we turn away from him, the Lord is inviting us to himself. That when we fear the Lord, even though we are sinful, even though we are not likable, we need to come. The Lord is still inviting us. There is still an invite, come. Because this woman, the Bible says in verse 42, it says, Therefore I tell you, because the many sins have been forgiven, she, loved, uh, she loves much, but he who has been given little, loves little. Which is to mean that the Lord is always inviting. Even though we have turned away from him, his invite still stands. He's still welcoming and he will not send you away as long as you come to him. We should not, number five, four, we are not afraid of the threats that come in life. And why aren't we afraid? The Bible tells us the kind of fear that we need to have. And it says in the book of uh, Luke 12 and verse 4 to 5, it says that we should not fear that which can kill the body. And after that, that's all. But he says we should fear he who can kill the body and the spirit in hell. And so every time we think of what should I be afraid of, there are many things that can cause us to die. And one of the things that can kill us, even as we speak, is COVID-19. But should we walk in fear when we know that the Lord is also on our side? Because he says it's true, it's possible. We may die in this physical body, but that can only kill our body. But the Lord, if he kills you, then he kills you and kills your spirit. And so when we come to him, we should not be afraid of that which is out there. Because there is one who can say, even though we die, we shall live again. And so every time there is fear that is rooming rage, the many things that are running amok, then we can turn to him and say, I oh, will fear not, because he is on my side. And though he will know I may die in the physical body, I am sure I can live again. Praise the Lord. That's what the Lord would want us to become. Lastly, I would want to look at what will cause us to maintain the fear of the Lord in our lives. What will cause us to maintain the fear of the Lord in our lives? Number one, keeping our hearts nourished of God's word. John 6 and verse 53 to verse 66, it talks of Jesus speaking to the disciples and he says, you will eat my flesh and drink my blood. And for that reason alone, they were agitated. They were hurt, some of them, because their thinking was, how will we eat his flesh? And by that reason alone, many of them did not follow him. And the Bible says in verse 36, and many of his disciples turned away. The reason why we would turn away is because as long as we come into the house of God or we live out there and we are not nourished, then we will not be able to survive. Why is that? Because the Bible tells us about that verse and it says, the spirit gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The word I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Every time the word of God is spoken to us, it is, they are not just empty words. This is the spirit that causes us to, uh, to, to be fulfilled, to be satisfied, to be contented. And he says, every time I speak to you, the word of God is life. And that word has eternal life. It's not only for a word that keeps you going now, but a word that helps you even to go to the future. It's the word that carries you. And so everyone that told Jesus, how can we eat your flesh? And they refused and they looked back. Then the Bible says, they all fell. Do you think it's not possible for us? That as long as we don't fear the Lord, as long as we have nothing that causes us to know what is expected of us, we will always be hungry, we will always be needy, 
and we will not be able to survive. It's only the word of God, if we take it and leave it, that we'll be able to cause us to carry on with the life that is marked for us. Quickly, as I try to finish, he also talks about the Bible, and Joshua talks about the book of law in Joshua 1 and verse 8. And he says, as he instructed after he took over from Moses, and he's telling them that this book of law should not depart from your mouth, from your lip, but you should teach it to your children every day and every night. For out of it, there is blessing. For you keeping the word of God, there are blessings. And you know, this word of God uh, in the current state that we are in, how did we have time? Because we are so much engaged in social media and the many other things that we are attracted to, that we hardly meditate upon the word of God. You know, every time you, want, you are about to fall in sin, the Holy Spirit, if you have a word of God in you, he will always quicken something and tell you, this is not the way to go. But if you are empty, if there is no word in you, then you are prone to everything that is out there. But the Lord desires that you meditate. And every word of God that the Bible talks about, it finishes by saying, after you meditate the word of God, it shall be well with you. It shall be well with your children. Which means without that, then it cannot be well. And you know what? Every time then that we come into the house of God, there are prayers that will keep praying, but they will never be answered. Because God knows your needs. He understands you. And all that he desires that we do is to obey his word. And as we obey it, then it says, these blessings shall follow you. I don't know how many of us would stand and say, because I'm so prayerful, everything that I have prayed, the Lord has answered. But I am also sure that things that we have also not prayed, because the Lord knows our needs, he gives them to us. He gives you a wife. He gives you children. He gives you blessings. He gives you growth. Not because you asked God of it, but because he knows you need it. It's not how much we pray. It is not how much we labor in his vineyard. It is because of, of obeying that which he says that we should obey. Number two, we should be doers of the word. This is just connecting with the very word. That it's in the obedience that God causes us to remain. And James 1 and verse 22, all the way to verse 25, it just still talks of the same. And it says, but the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and continues to do so, and not being forget, uh, forgetful hearer, but an effective doer, he will be blessed in whatever he does. He's just reminding us the same. Even as Joshua said, it is in the doing that we continue to receive the blessing that the Lord has for us. Number four is paying the sacrifice of your faith. And some, and David being one of the greatest men that, whose heart was after God's heart. He tells us in Samuel, second Samuel 24 and verse 24, and he says, I cannot give God something that cannot cost me. You know? And in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 23, the Bible tells us of everything that we have in life is everything that, uh, that, that is there is permissible. But not everything is beneficial, nor is everything edifying. Meaning, just as I said, that God would be like our mother saying, do all that you want. But he says, you need to weigh the benefits. What benefit will I get for doing whatever I want to do? What sacrifice will you pay for the Lord to be glorified in that which you do? You cannot just serve God just like that. It has to cost you. And the Bible, Jesus speaking, he says that every builder has to count the cost. Or an army has to weigh its armory before it goes to war. Because you need to ask yourself, how will I overcome? How will I conquer? If I just go into war, salvation is costly. Praise the Lord. We cannot just enjoy salvation just like that. 
Like Jesus did it all on the cross. And so you come to him anyhow and in whatever form. It is true. The invite remains. Come however you are. But after he cleanses you, he does not tell you to remain anyhow. He is telling you that there is a cost. He will allow you to do everything. But as he says that in Paul telling us in Corinthians, he says everything is permissible. But then you have to ask of yourself. Is it beneficial? Is it profiting? Is it edifying? Look at the many things that you have to do in life every morning. And for God to remain exalted, then you have to ask yourself, how fulfilling with this? How long will I go if I did this? How much will I gain? It's true. You can gain things, monetary value, things of monetary value. But will that keep you happy in God? The Lord desires that we pay a sacrifice. I don't know in what area, but there has to be a sacrifice that you have to say, I'm young, yes, but I will have to wait until the day, until that very moment that the church will declare, this is man and wife. It's a sacrifice. It will not come easy, but you have to pay it. And then you will stand and say, for I trusted the Lord. Then he has brought me this far. For I waited on the Lord, as David says. Then the Lord has lifted me up. There has to be a sacrifice for us to remain in the house of God. Lastly, but not least, fearing God leads us to break so that we can please him. And we see this in two instances. And they are captured well in David's case. He sinned with Uriah's wife and he killed him. And secondly, David also happened to have thought that he is great and mighty. And so he asked his commander who also was involved in these two instances, Joab. And he says, go and count the army. And as he counted the army, then God was so provoked. God was not happy. Because he thought David would have trusted him for his own battles. But the thing that I like about it, and which the Bible brings out, in the first instance, when David or Nathan came to David and he tells him, the man that took that man's sheep or lamb and killed it, it is you. Then David, having before then told the prophet that that man was to die. Whoever did that needs to die. But when he was confronted, then he says, I have sinned before the Lord. And he sought forgiveness before God. In the second instance, after he was told by God all, when the prophet again came to him, God, and told him that you should not have numbered the army of Israel. Then again, David breaks before God. And he says, God, I will choose your punishment. I choose that you follow after me. I choose that it is you because you are merciful. That even though you pursue me, you are full of mercy. For us to attract the fear of God or for us to remain with the fear of God, we need to remain broken. Whenever we are established that there is something that is not right in our lives, then we need to be like David. Lord, I have sinned. Not that we go before God blagging, you know. You can even appear in the media saying, I'm not the one. But while we know there is sin, we need to acknowledge there is sin. And tell the Lord, God, I have sinned against you. It is you alone. And David continues in Psalms 51 and he says, Please do not remove the joy of your salvation within me. But renew the joy of your salvation within me. And he's calling God and he says, wash me, cleanse me, wash me with the high soap that I may be as clean so that I can please you. Praise the Lord. For us to retain the fear of God, we need to be broken. We need to keep breaking that every time sin is mentioned in our lives, we are not seeking to hide. We are not giving that sin a name. We are not coloring the sin. But we are coming before God and breaking and saying, Father, it is me. It is me, Lord, that you need to touch again. It is me, Lord, that you need to lift again. So that we can walk again with God for his so desires. May the Lord help you and me. 
that we can become that which he desires. You may be there. You could be having an area that you are saying, this is where, Lord, I lost your fear. This is where I lost it. Come through for me. I would want us to ask the Lord to remember us, that he may bring back the fear. We may be, instead of being repassed, we'll be invited and we'll let the Lord make us what he wants us to be. We can stand up if you so feel that you want to invite the Lord, even as we say a prayer in a minute. Every eye closed, we pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you because it is you who desires us to be found in you. We may be turning away many at times, lost in our own ways and things, our Lord. But Lord, when we think of you at times, we may be filled with fear, even desires to run away from you. But this morning, Lord, we have learned that your fear means good for us. We need to be more worried of you than anything else. But even as we get fearful, your fear is so inviting that you can make us. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that this morning, if there be any one of us, Lord, that is away, that has gone away, that is still on the run because of the fear of the Lord, Father, we know, though you are consuming fire, you are a God that is also inviting, Lord, because you are calling to the Zion, to the city of Jerusalem, where hearts of many are made whole. Father, may every heart that has turned away this morning be made whole and complete and even, Lord, awakened and quickened even for thy own glory. Be glorified. If you be in our midst and you are desiring that the Lord may come into your life, we wish that you lift up your hand. We can pray with you. You are inviting the Lord to come into your life. Thank you for that hand. Anyone else? You're telling the Lord... It is true, I've learned away from you, but today I come that you may have your way. Father, we thank you for this dear one. Even as she has lifted her hand to you, she desires that you come into her life. This morning, we receive her into the kingdom of God. And we thank you that, Father, her name is now being moved from the book of condemnation to the book of life. Father, as she gets to be assisted and to be helped to know you, may you enthrone yourself even in her life. In Jesus' name, amen. Give God a shout and pray.